The Old Die Rich by H. L. Gold Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Carter X-1 Project The Old Die Rich by H. L. Gold Part 1 it is the kind of news item you read at least a dozen times a year, wonder about briefly, and then promptly forget. But the real story is the one that the reporters are unable to cover. "'You again, Weldon,' the medical examiner said wearily. I nodded pleasantly and looked around the shabby room with a feeling of hopeful eagerness. Maybe this time, I thought, I'd get the answer. I had the same sensation I always had in these places— the quavery senile despair at being closed in a room with the single shaky chair, tottering bureau, dim bulb hanging from the ceiling, the flaking metal bed. There was a woman on the bed, an old woman with white hair thin enough to show the tight-drawn scalp, her face and body so emaciated that the flesh between the bones formed parchment pockets. The M.E. was going over her as if she were a side of beef that he had to put a federal grade stamp on, grumbling meanwhile about me and Sergeant Lou Pape, who had brought me here. "'When are you going to stop taking Weldon around to these cases, Sergeant?' the Emmy demanded in annoyance. "'Damned actor and his morbid curiosity!' For the first time Lou was stung into defending me. "'Mr. Weldon is a friend of mine. I used to be an actor, too, before I joined the force. And he's a follower of Stanislavski.' The beat cop who'd reported the DOA whipped around at the door. "'A red?' I let Lou Pape explain what the Stanislavski method of acting was, while I sat down on the one chair and tried to apply it. Stanislavski was the great pre-revolution Russian stage director, whose idea was that actors had to think and feel like the characters they portrayed so they could be them. A Stanislavskian works out everything about a character right up to the point where a play starts, where he was born, when, his relationship with his parents, education, childhood, adolescence, maturity, attitudes towards men, women, sex, money, success, including incidents. The play itself is just an extension of the life history created by the actor. How does that tie in with the old woman who had died? Well, I'd had the cockeyed kind of luck to go bald at twenty-five, and I'd been playing old men ever since. I had them down pretty well. It's not just a matter of shuffling around all hunched over and talking in a high-cracked voice, which is cornball acting, but learning what old people are like inside, and these cases I talked Lou Pape into taking me on were studies in senility. I wanted to understand them, know what made them do what they did, feel the compulsion that drove them to it. The old woman on the bed, for instance, had $32,000 in five bank accounts, and she died of starvation. You've come across such cases in the news, at least a dozen a year, and wondered who they were and why they did it. But you read the items, thought about them for a little while, and then forgot them. My interest was professional. I made my living playing old people, and I had to know as much about them as I could. That's how it started off, at any rate. But the more cases I investigated, the less sense they made to me, until finally they were practically an obsession. Look, they almost always have around $30,000 pinned to their underwear, hidden in mattresses, or parked in the bank, yet they starve themselves to death. If I could understand them, I could write a play, or have one written. I might really make a name for myself, even get a Hollywood contract, maybe, if I could act them as they should be acted. So I sat there in the lone chair, trying to reconstruct the character of the old woman who had died, rather than spend a single cent of her $32,000 for food. "'Malnutrition induced by senile psychosis,' the M.E. said, writing out the death certificate. He turned to me. "'There's no mystery to it, Weldon. They starve because they're less afraid of death than digging into their savings. I'd been imagining myself growing weak from hunger and trying to decide that I ought to eat, even if it cost me something.' I came out of it and said, "'That's what you keep telling me. "'I keep hoping it'll convince you "'so you won't come around any more. "'What are the chances, Weldon?' "'Depends. "'I will when I'm sure you're right. "'I'm not.' He shrugged disgustedly, ordered the wicker basket from the meat wagon, and had the old woman carried out. He and the beep cop left with the basket team. He could at least have said goodbye. He never did, though. A fat lot I cared about his attitude or dogmatic medical opinion. Getting inside this character was more important. The setting should have helped. It was depressing, rank with the feel of solitary desperation and needless death. Lou Pape stood looking out the one dirty window, waiting patiently for me. 
I let my joints stiffen as if they were thirty years older and more worn out than they were, and empathized myself into a dilemma between getting still weaker from hunger and drawing a little money out of the bank. I worked at it for half an hour or so with the deep concentration you acquire when you use the Stanislavsky method. Then I gave up. The Emmy is wrong, Lou, I said. It doesn't feel right. Lou turned around from the window. He'd stood there all that time without once coughing or scratching or doing anything else that might have distracted me. He knows his business, Mark. But he doesn't know old people. What is it you don't get? he prompted, helping me dig my way through a characterization like the trained Stanislavsky and he was, and still would have been if he hadn't gotten so sick of the insecurity of acting that he'd become a cop. Can't money be more important to a psychotic than eating? Sure, I agreed. Up to a point. Under eating, yes. Actual starvation, no. Why not? You and the M.E. think it's easy to starve to death. It isn't. Not when you can buy day-old bread at the bakeries, soup bones for about a nickel a pound, wilted vegetables that groceries are glad to get rid of. Anybody who's willing to eat that stuff can stay alive on nearly nothing a day. Nearly nothing, Lou, and hunger is a damned potent instinct. I can understand hating to spend even those few cents. I can't see going without food altogether. He took out a cigarette. He hadn't until then because he didn't want to interrupt my concentration. Maybe they get too weak to go out after old bread and meat bones and wilted vegetables. It still doesn't figure. I got up off the shaky chair, my joints now really stiff from sitting in it. Do you know how long it takes to die of starvation? That depends on age, health, amount of activity. Nuts, I said. It would take weeks. So it takes weeks. Where's the problem? If there is one. I lit the pipe I'd learned to smoke instead of cigarettes. Old men seem to use pipes more than anything else, though maybe it'll be different in the next generation. More cigarette smokers now, you see, and they'd stick to the habit unless the doctor ordered them to cut it out. Did you ever try starving for weeks, Lou? I asked. No. Did you? In a way. All these cases you've been taking me on for the last couple of years. I've tried to be them. But let's say it's possible to die of starvation when you have thousands of dollars put away. Let's say you don't think of scrounging off food stores, or working out a way of freeloading, or hitting soup lines. Let's say you stay in your room and slowly starve to death. He slowly picked a fleck of tobacco off his lip and flicked it away, his sharp black eyes poking holes in the situation I'd built up for him. But he wasn't ready to say anything yet. There's charity, I went on. Relief. Except for those who have their dough in banks where it can be checked on. Old age pension, panhandling, cadging off neighbors. He said, we know these cases are hermits. They don't make contact with anybody. Even when they're starting to get real hungry? You've got something, Mark, but that's the wrong tack, he said thoughtfully. The point is that they don't have to make contact. Other people know them, or about them. Somebody would check after a few days or a week. The janitor, the landlord, someone in the house or the neighborhood. So they'd be found before they died. You'd think so, wouldn't you? He agreed reluctantly. They don't generally have friends, and the relatives are usually so distant they hardly know these old people and whether they're alive or not. Maybe that's what threw us off. But you don't need friends and relatives to start wondering and investigate when you haven't shown up for a while. He lifted his head and looked at me. What does that prove, Mark? That there's something wrong with these cases. I want to find out what. I got Lou to take me down to headquarters, where he let me see the bank books the old woman had left. She took damned good care of them, I said. They look almost new. Wouldn't you take damned good care of the most important thing in the world to you? He asked. You've seen the hordes of money the others leave. Same thing. I peered closely at the earliest entry. April 23, 1907, $150. My eyes aren't that bad. I was peering at the ink. It was dark, unfaded. I pointed it out to Lou. From not being exposed to daylight much, he said. They don't haul out the bank books or money very often, I guess. And that adds up for you? I can see them being psychotics all their lives, but not senile psychotics. They hoarded, Mark. That adds up for me. Funny, I said, watching him maneuver his cigarette, as if he loved the feel of it, drawing the smoke down and letting it out in plumes of different shapes, from rings to slender streams. What a living he could make doing cigarette commercials on TV. I can see you turn into one of these cases, Lou. He looked startled for a second, but then crushed out the butt carefully so he could watch it instead of me. Yeah? How so? You've been too scared by poverty to take a chance. 
You know you could do all right acting, but you don't dare giving up this crummy job. Carry that far enough and you try to stop spending money, then cut out eating, and finally wind up dead of starvation in a cheap room. Me? I'd never get that scared of being broke. At the age of seventy or eighty? Especially then. I'd probably tear loose for a while and then buy into a home for the aged. I wanted to grin, but I didn't. He'd proved my point. He'd also shown that he was as bothered by these old people as I was. Tell me, Lou. If somebody kept you from dying, would you give him any dough for it, even if you were a senile psychotic? I could see him using the Stanislavski method to feel his way to the answer. He shook his head. Not while I was alive. Will it, maybe. Not give it. How would that be as a motive? He leaned against a metal filing cabinet. No good, Mark. You know what a hell of a time we have tracking down relatives to give the money to, because these people don't leave wills. The few relatives we find are always surprised when they get their inheritance. Most of them hardly remember dear old whoever it was that died and left it to them. All the other estates eventually go to the state treasury, unclaimed. Well, it was an idea. I opened the oldest bank book again. Anybody ever think of testing the ink, Lou? What for? The bank's records always check. These aren't forgeries, if that's what you're thinking. I don't know what I'm thinking, I admitted. But I'd like to turn a chemist loose on this for a little while. Look, Mark, there's a lot I'm willing to do for you, and I think I've done plenty, but there's a limit. I let him explain why he couldn't let me borrow the book, and then waited while he figured out how it could be done, and did it. He was still grumbling when he helped me pick a chemist out of the telephone directory and went along to the lab with me. But don't get any wrong notions, he said on the way. I have to protect state property, that's all, because I signed for it and I'm responsible. Sure, sure, I agreed to humor him. If you're not curious, why not just wait outside for me? He gave me one of those white-tooth grins that he had no right to deprive women audiences of. I could do that, but I'd rather see you make a sap of yourself. I turned the bank book over to the chemist, and we waited for the report. When it came, it had to be translated. The ink was typical of those used fifty years ago. Lupape gave me a jab in the ribs at that. But then the chemist said that, according to the amount of oxidation, it seemed fresh enough to be only a few months or years old, and it was Lou's turn to get jabbed. Lou pushed him about the aging, asking if it couldn't be the result of unusually good care. The chemist couldn't say. That depended on the kind of care, an airtight compartment, perhaps, filled with one of the inert gases or a vacuum. They hadn't been kept that way, of course, so Lou looked as baffled as I felt. He took the bank book, and we went out to the street. "'See what I mean?' I asked quietly, not wanting to rub it in. "'I see something, but I don't know what. Do you?' "'I wish I could say yes.' doesn't make any more sense than anything else about these cases. What do you do next? Damned if I know. There are thousands of old people in the city. Only a few of them take this way out. I have to try to find them before they do. If they're loaded, they won't say so, Mark. And there's no way of telling them from those who are down and out. I rubbed my pipe disgruntledly against the side of my nose to oil it. Ain't this a beaut of a problem? I wish I liked problems. I hate them. Lou had to get back on duty. I had nowhere to go and nothing to do except worry my way through this tangle. He headed back to headquarters, and I went over to the park and sat in the sun, warming myself and trying to think like a senile psychotic who would rather die of starvation than spend a few cents for food. I didn't get anywhere, naturally. There are too many ways of beating starvation, too many chances of being found before it's too late. And the fresh ink, over half a century old... I took to hanging around banks, hoping I'd see someone come in with an old bank book that had fresh ink from fifty years before. Lou was some help there. He convinced the guards and tellers that I wasn't an old-looking guy casing the place for a gang, and even got the tellers to watch out for particularly dark ink in ancient bank books. I stuck at it for a month, although there were a few stage calls that didn't turn out right, and one radio and two TV parts, which did, and kept me going. I was almost glad the stage parts hadn't been given to me. They'd have interrupted my outside work. After a month without a thing turning up at the banks, though, I went back to my two rooms in the theatrical hotel one night, tired and discouraged, and I found Lou there. I expected him to give me another talk on dropping the whole thing. He'd been doing that for a couple of weeks now, every time we got together. I felt too low to put up an argument. But Lou was holding back his excitement, acting like a cop, you know, instead of projecting his feelings, and he couldn't haul me out to his car as fast as he probably wanted me to go. "'Been trying to get in touch with you all day, Mark.' Some old guy was found wandering around, dazed and suffering from malnutrition, with $17,000 in cash inside the lining of his jacket. Alive? 
I asked, shocked right into eagerness again. Just barely. They're trying intravenous feeding to pull him through. I don't think he'll make it. For God's sake, let's get there before he conks out. Lou raced me to the city hospital and up to the ward. There was a scrawny old man in a bed, nothing but a papery skin stretched thin over a face like a skull and a body like a Halloween skeleton, shivering as if he was cold. I knew it wasn't the cold. The medics were injecting a heart stimulant into him, and he was vibrating like a rattletrap car racing over a gravel road. "'Who are you?' I practically yelled, grabbing his skinny arm. "'What happened to you?' He went on shaking with his eyes closed and his mouth open. "'Ah, oh, hell!' I said, disgusted. "'He's in a coma.' "'He might start talking,' Lou told me. "'I fixed it up so you can sit here and listen in case he does. "'So I can listen to delirious ravings, you mean?' Lou got me a chair and put it next to the bed. "'What are you kicking about? This is the first live one you've seen, isn't it? That ought to be good enough for you.' He looked as annoyed as a director. "'Besides, you can get biographical data out of delirium that you'd never get if he was conscious.' He was right, of course. Not only data, but attitudes, wishes, resentments that would normally be repressed. I wasn't thinking of acting at the moment, though. Here was somebody who could tell me what I wanted to know, only he couldn't talk. Lou went to the door. "'Good luck.' he said, and went out. I sat down and stared at the old man, willing him to talk. I don't have to ask if you've ever done that. Everybody has. You keep thinking over and over, getting more and more tense. Talk, damn you, talk! Until you find that every muscle in your body is a fist, and your jaws are aching because you've been clenching your teeth so hard. You might just as well not bother, but once in a while a coincidence makes you think you've done it. Like now. The old man sort of came to. That is, he opened his eyes and looked around without seeing anything, or it was so far away and long ago that nobody else could see what he saw. I hunched forward on the chair and willed harder than ever. Nothing happened. He stared at the ceiling and through and beyond me. Then he closed his eyes again and I slumped back, defeated and bitter. But that was when he began talking. There were a couple of women, though they might have been little girls in his childhood, and he had his troubles with them. He was praying for a toy train, a roadster, to pass his tests, to keep from being fired, to be less lonely, and back to toys again. He hated his father, and his mother was too busy with church bazaars and such to pay much attention to him. There was a sister. She died when he was a kid. He was glad she died, hoping maybe now his mother would notice him. But he was also filled with guilt because he was glad. Then somebody, he felt, was trying to shove him out of his job. The intravenous feeding kept dripping into his vein, and he went on rambling. After ten or fifteen minutes of it, he fell asleep. I felt so disappointed that I could have slapped him awake, only it wouldn't have done any good. Smoking would have helped me relax, but it wasn't allowed, and I didn't dare go outside for one, for fear he might revive again, and this time come up to the present. Broke! he suddenly shrieked, trying to sit up. I pushed him down gently, and he went on in frightful terror. Old and poor! Nowhere to go! Nobody wants me! Can't make a living! read the ads every day, no jobs for old men. He blurted through weeks, months, years, I don't know, of fear and despair. And finally he came to something that made his face glow like a radium dial. An ad, no experience needed, good salary. His face got dark and awful. All he added was, El Greco, or something that sounded like it, and then he went into terminal breathing. I rang for the nurse, and she went for the doctor. I couldn't stand the long moments when the old man's chest stopped moving, the abrupt frantic gulps of air followed by no breath at all. I wanted to get away from it, but I had to wait for whatever more he might say. It didn't come. His eyes fogged and rolled up, and he stopped taking those spasmodic, strangling breaths. The nurse came back with the doctor, who felt his pulse and shook his head. She pulled the blanket over the old man's face. I left, feeling sick. I'd learned things I already knew about hate and love and fear and hope and frustration. There was an ad in it somewhere, but I had no way of telling if it had been years ago or recently. And a name that sounded like El Greco. That was a Spanish painter of four or five hundred years ago. Had the old guy been remembering a picture he'd seen? No, he'd come up at least close to the present. The ad seemed to solve his problem about being broke. But what about the seventeen thousand dollars that had been found in the lining of his jacket? He hadn't mentioned that. Of course, being a senile psychotic, he could have considered himself broke even with that amount of money. None coming in, you see. That didn't add up either. His was the terror of being old and jobless. If he'd had money, he would have figured out how to make it last, and that would have come through in one way or another. There was the ad, 
There was his hope, and there was this El Greco. A Greek restaurant, maybe, where he might have been bumming his meals. But where did the seventeen thousand dollars fit in? Lou Pape was too fed up with the whole thing to discuss it with me. He just gave me the weary eye and said, "'You're riding this too hard, Mark. The guy was talking from fever. How do I know what figures and what doesn't when I'm dealing with insanity or delirium?' "'But you admit there's plenty about these cases that doesn't figure.' "'Sure. Did you take a look at the condition the world is in lately? Why should these old people be any exception?' I couldn't blame him. He pulled me in on the cases with plenty of trouble to himself, just to do me a favor. Now he was fed up. I guess it wasn't even that. He thought I was ruining myself, at least financially and maybe worse, by trying to run down the problem. He said he'd be glad to see me any time and gas about anything, or help me with whatever might be bothering me, if he could, but not these cases any more. He told me to lay off them, and then he left me on my own. I don't know what he could have done, actually. I didn't need him to go through the want ads with me, which I was doing every day, figuring there might be something in the ravings about an ad. I spent more time than I liked checking those slanted at old people, only to find they were supposed to become messengers and such. One brought me to an old brownstone five-story house in the East Eighties. I got online with the rest of the applicants. There were men and women, all decrepit, all looking badly in need of money, and waited my turn. My face was lined with collodion wrinkles, and I wore an antique shiny suit and run-down shoes. I didn't look more prosperous or any younger than they did. I finally came up to the woman who was doing the interviewing. She sat behind a plain office desk down in the main floor hall, with a pile of application cards in front of her and a ballpoint pen in one strong, slender hand. She had red hair with gold lights in it, and eyes so pale blue that they would have seemed the same color as the whites if she'd been on the stage. Her face would have been beautiful, except for her rigid control of expression. She smiled abruptly, shut it off just like that, looked me over with all the impersonality and penetration of an X-ray from the soles to the bald head, exactly as she'd done with the others. But that skin, if it was as perfect as that all over her slim, stiffly erect, proudly shaped body, she had no business off the stage. Name, address, previous occupation, social security number she asked in a voice with good clarity, resonance, and diction. She wrote it all down while I gave the information to her. Then she asked me for references, and I mentioned Sergeant Lou Pape. Fine, she said. We'll get in touch with you if anything comes up. Don't call us. We'll call you. I hung around to see who'd be picked. There was only one, an old man, two ahead of me in the line, who had no social security number, no references, not even any relatives or friends she could have checked up on him with. Damn! Of course that was what she wanted. Hadn't all the starvation cases been people without social security, references, either no friends and relatives, or those they'd lost track of? I'd pulled a blooper, but how was I to know until too late? Well, there was a way of making it right. When it was good and dark that evening, I stood on the corner and watched the lights in the brownstone house. The ones on the first two floors went out, leaving only those on the third and fourth. Closed for the day, or open for business? I got into a building a few doors down by pushing a button and waiting until the buzzer answered, then racing up to the roof while some man yelled down the stairs to find out who was there. I crossed the tops of the two houses between and went down the fire escape. It wasn't easy, though not as tough as you might imagine. The fact is that I'm a whole year younger than Lou Pape, even if I could play his grandpa professionally. I still have muscles left, and I used them to get down the fire escape at the rear of the house. The fourth-floor room I looked into had some kind of wire-mesh cage and some hooded machinery. Nobody there. The third-floor room was the Redhead's. She was coming out of the bathroom with a terrycloth bathrobe and a towel turban on when I looked in. She slid the robe off and began dusting herself with powder. That skin did cover her. She turned and moved toward a vanity against the wall that I was on the other side of. The next thing I knew, the window was flung open and she had a gun on me. "'Come right in, Mr. Weldon, isn't it?' she said in that completely controlled voice of hers. One day her control would crack, I thought irrelevantly, and the pieces would be found from Dallas to North Carolina. "'I had an idea you seemed more curious than was justified by a help-wanted ad.' "'Man my age doesn't get to see many pretty girls,' I told her, making my own voice crack pathetically in a senile whinny. She motioned me into the room. When I was inside, I saw a light over the window blinking red. It stopped the moment I was in the room. A silent burglar alarm. She let her pale blue eyes wash insolently over me. A man your age can see all the pretty girls he wants to. You're not old. And you use a rinse, I retorted. She ignored it. 
I specifically advertised for old people. Why did you apply? It had happened so abruptly that I hadn't had a chance to use the Stanislavsky method to feel old in the presence of a beautiful nude woman. I don't even know if it would have worked. Nothing's perfect. I needed a job awful bad, I answered sullenly, knowing it sounded like an ad lib. She smiled with more contempt than humor. You had a job, Mr. Weldon. You were very busy trying to find out why senile psychotics starve themselves to death. How did you know that? I asked, startled. A little investigation of my own. I also happen to know you didn't tell your friend Sergeant Pape that you were going to be here tonight. That was a fact, too. I hadn't felt sure enough that I'd found the answer to call him about it. Looking at the gun in her steady hand, I was sorry I hadn't. But you did find out I own this building, that my name is May Roberts, and that I'm the daughter of the late Dr. Anthony Roberts, the physicist, she continued. Is there anything else you want me to tell you about yourself? I know enough already. I'm more interested in you in the starvation cases. If you weren't connected with them, you wouldn't have known I was investigating them. That's obvious, isn't it? She reached for a cigarette on the vanity and used a lighter with her free hand. The big mirror gave me another view of her lovely body, but that was beginning to interest me less than the gun. I thought of making a grab for it. There was too much distance between us, though, and she knew better than to take her eyes off me while she was lighting up. I'm not afraid of professional detectives, Mr. Weldon. They deal only with facts, and every one of them will draw the same conclusions from a given set of circumstances. I don't like amateurs. They guess too much. They don't stick to reality. The result, her pale eyes chilled and her shapely mouth went hard, is that they are likely to get too close to the truth. I wanted to smoke myself, but I wasn't willing to make a move toward the pipe in my pocket. I may be close to the truth, Miss Roberts, but I don't know what the devil it is. I still don't know how you're tied in with the senile psychotics or why they starve with all that money. You could let me go, and I wouldn't have a thing on you. She glanced down at herself and laughed for real for the first time. You wouldn't, would you? On the other hand, you know where I'm working from and could nag Sergeant Pape into getting a search warrant. It wouldn't incriminate me, but it would be inconvenient. I don't care to be inconvenienced. Which means what? You want to find out my connection with senile psychotics? I intend to show you. How? She gestured dangerously with the gun. Turn your face to the wall and stay that way while I get dressed. Make one attempt to turn around before I tell you to, and I'll shoot you. You're guilty of housebreaking, you know. It would be a little inconvenient for me to have an investigation, but not as inconvenient as for you. I faced the wall, feeling my stomach braid itself into a tight, painful knot of fear. Of what? I didn't know yet, only that old people who had something to do with her died of starvation. I wasn't old, but that didn't seem very comforting. She was the most frigid, calculating, deadly woman I'd ever met. That alone was enough to scare hell out of me. And there was the problem of what she was capable of. Hearing the sounds of her dressing behind me, I wanted to lunge around and rush her, taking a chance that she might be too busy pulling on a girdle or reaching back to fasten a bra to have the gun in her hand. It was a suicidal impulse, and I gave it up instantly. Other women might compulsively finish concealing themselves before snatching up the gun. Not her. All right, she said at last. I faced her. She was wearing coveralls that, if anything, emphasized the curves of her figure. She had a sort of babushka that covered her red hair and kept it in place, the kind of thing women workers used to wear in factories during the war. She had looked lethal with nothing on but a gun and a hard expression. She looked like a sentence of execution now. Open that door. "'Turn to the right and go upstairs,' she told me, indicating directions with the gun. I went. It was the longest, most anxious short walk I've ever taken. She ordered me to open a door on the fourth floor, and we were inside the room I'd seen from the fire escape. The mesh cage seemed like a torture chamber to me, the hooded motors designed to shoot an agonizing current through my emaciating body. "'You going to do to me what you did to the old man you hired today?' I probed, hoping for an answer that would really answer." She flipped on the switch that started the motors, and there was a shrill, menacing whine. The wire mesh of the cage began blurring oddly, as if vibrating like the tines of a tuning fork. "'You've been an unexpected nuisance, Weldon,' she said above the motors. "'I never thought you'd get this far. But as long as you have, we might as well both benefit by it.' 
benefit? I repeated. Both of us? She opened the drawer of a work table and pulled out a stack of envelopes held with a rubber band. She put the stack at the other edge of the table. Would you rather have all cash or bank accounts or both? My heart began to beat. She was where the money came from. You trying to tell me you're a philanthropist? I demanded. Business is philanthropy in a way, she answered calmly. You need money, and I need your services. To that extent, we're doing each other a favor. I think you'll find that the favor I'm going to do for you is a pretty considerable one. Would you mind picking up the envelopes on the table? I took the stack and stared at the top envelope. May 15, 1931. I read aloud and looked suspiciously at her. What's this for? I don't think it's something that can be explained. At least it's never been possible before, and I doubt if it would be now. I'm assuming you want both cash and bank accounts. Is that right? Well, yes, only we'll discuss it later. She looked along a row of shelves against one wall, searching the labels on the stacks of bundles there. She drew one out and pushed it toward me. Please open that and put on the things you'll find inside. I tore open the bundle. It contained a very plain business suit, black shoes, shirt, tie, and a hat with a narrow brim. Are these supposed to be my burial clothes? I asked you to put them on, she said. If you want me to make that a command, I'll do it. I looked at the gun, and I looked at the clothes, and then for some shelter I could change behind. There wasn't any. She smiled. You didn't seem concerned about my modesty. I don't see why your own should bother you. Get dressed. I obeyed, my mind anxiously chasing one possibility after another, all of them ending up with my death. I got into the other things and felt even more uncomfortable. They were all only an approximate fit, the shoes a little too tight and pointed, the collar of the shirt too stiffly starched, and too high under my chin, the gray suit too narrow at the shoulders and the ankles. I wished I had a mirror to see myself in. I felt like an ultra-conservative Wall Street broker, and I was sure I resembled one. "'All right,' she said. "'Put the envelopes in your inside pocket. You'll find instructions on each. Follow them carefully.' "'I don't get it,' I protested. You will. Now step into the mesh cage. Use the envelopes in the order they're arranged in. But what's this all about? I can tell you just one thing, Mr. Weldon. Don't try to escape. It can't be done. Your other questions will answer themselves if you follow the instructions on the envelopes. She had the gun in her hand. I went into the mesh cage, not knowing what to expect and yet too afraid of her to refuse. I didn't want to end up dead of starvation, no matter how much money she might have given me. But I didn't want to get shot, either. She closed the mesh gate and pushed the switch as far as it would go. The motors screamed as they picked up speed. The mesh cage vibrated more swiftly. I could see her through it as if there were nothing between us. And then I couldn't see her at all. I was outside a bank on a sunny day in spring. My fear evaporated instantly. I'd escaped somehow. But then a couple of realizations slapped me from each side. It was day instead of night. I was out on the street, and not in her brownstone house. Even the season had changed. Dazed, I stared at the people passing by. They looked like characters in a TV movie, the women wearing long dresses and flower-pot hats, their faces made up with petulant rosebud mouths and bright blotches of rouge, the men in hard straw hats, suit with narrow shoulders, plain black or brown shoes, the same kind of clothes I was wearing. The rumble of traffic in the street caught me next. Cars with square bodies, tubular radiators. For a moment I let terror soak through me. Then I remembered the mesh cage and the motors. May Roberts could have given me electroshock, kept me under long enough for the season to change, or taken me south and left me on a street in daylight. But this was a street in New York. I recognized it, though some of the buildings seemed changed. The people dressed more shabbily. Shrewd stage setting? Hypnosis? That was it, of course. She'd hypnotized me. Except that a subject under hypnosis doesn't know he's been hypnotized. Completely confused, I took out the stack of envelopes I'd put in my pocket. I was supposed to have both cash and a bank account, and I was outside a bank. She obviously wanted me to go in, so I did. I handed the top envelope to the teller. He hauled $150 out of it and looked at me as if that was enough to buy and sell the bank. He asked me if I had an account there. I didn't. He took me over to an officer of the bank, a fellow with a Hoover collar and a John Gilbert mustache, who signed me up more cordially than I'd been treated in years. 
I walked out to the street, gaping at the entry in the bank book he'd handed me. My pulse was jumping lumpily, my lungs refusing to work right, my head doing a Hopi rain dance. The date he'd stamped was May 15, 1931. I didn't know which I was more afraid of, being stranded, middle-aged, in the worst of the Depression, or being yanked back to that brownstone house. I had only an instant to realize that I was a kid in high school uptown right at that moment. Then the whole scene vanished as fast as blinking, and I was outside another bank somewhere else in the city. The date on the envelope was May 29th, and it was still 1931. I made a $75 deposit there, then $100 in another place a few days later, and so forth, spending only a few minutes each time, and going forward anywhere from a couple of days to almost a month. Every now and then I had a stamped, addressed envelope to mail at a corner box. They were addressed to different stockbrokers, and when I got one open before mailing it and took a look inside, it turned out to be an order to buy a few hundred shares of stock in a soft drink company in the name of Dr. Anthony Roberts. I hadn't remembered the price of the shares being that low. The last time I'd seen the quotation, it was more than five times as much as it was then. I was making dough myself, but I was doing even better for May Roberts. A few times I had to stay around for an hour or so. It was the night I found myself in a flashy speakeasy with two envelopes that I was to bet the contents of, according to the instructions on the outside. It was June 21, 1932, and I had to bet on Jack Sharkey to take the heavyweight title away from Max Schmeling. The place was serious and quiet. No more than three women, a couple of bartenders, and the rest male customers, including two cops, huddling up close to the radio. An affable character was taking bets. He gave me a wise little smile when I put the money down on Sharky. "'Well, it's a pleasure to do business with a man who wants an American to win,' he said. "'And the hell with a smart dough, eh?' "'Yeah,' I said, and tried to smile back, but so much of the smart money was going on Schmelling that I wondered if May Roberts hadn't made a mistake. I couldn't remember who'd won. "'You know what J.P. Morgan said? Don't sell America short.' "'I'll take a buck for my share,' said a sour guy who barely managed to stand." Lousy grass growing in the lousy streets. Nobody working. No future. Nothing. We'll come out of it okay, I told him confidently. He snorted into his gin. Not in our lifetime, Mac. It'd take a miracle to put this country on its feet again. I don't believe in miracles. He put his scowling face up close to mine and breathed blearily and belligerently at me. Do you? Shut up, Gus. One of the bartenders said, The fight's starting. I had some tough moments and a lot of bad scotch listening. It went the whole fifteen rounds. Sharky won, and I was in almost as bad shape as Gus, who'd passed out halfway through the battle. All I can recall is the affable character handing over a big roll and saying, Lucky for me, more guys don't sell America short, and trying to separate the money into the right amounts and put them into the right envelopes while stumbling out of the door, when everything changed and I was outside a bank again. I thought, my God, what a hangover cure. I was as sober as if I hadn't had a drink when I made that deposit. There were more envelopes to mail and more deposits to make and bets to put down on Singing Wood in 1933 at Belmont Park and Max Bear over Premier Canero and then Cavalcade at Churchill Downs in 1934 and James Braddock over Bear in 1935 and a big daily double payoff, Winoa Arake at Tropical Park and so on, skipping through the years like a flat stone over water, touching here and there for a few minutes to an hour at a time. I kept the envelopes for May Roberts and myself in different pockets, and the bank books in another. The envelopes were beginning to bulge, and the deposits and accrued interest were something to watch grow. The whole thing, in fact, was so exciting that it was early October of 1938, a total of maybe four or five hours subjectively, before I realized what she had me doing. I wasn't thinking much about the fact that I was time-traveling, or how she did it. I accepted that, though the sensation in some ways was creepy, like raising the dead. My father and mother, for instance, were still alive in 1938. If I could break away from whatever it was that kept pulling me jumpily through time, I could go and see them. The thought attracted me enough to make me shake badly with intent, yet pump dread through me. I wanted so damned badly to see them again, and I didn't dare. I couldn't. Why couldn't I? Maybe the machine covered only the area around the various banks, speakeasies, bars, and horse parlors. If I could get out of the area, whatever it might be, I could avoid coming back to whatever May Roberts had lined up for me. Because naturally I knew now what I was doing. 
I was making deposits and winning sure bets just as the senile psychotics had done. The ink on their bank books and bills was fresh because it was fresh. It wasn't given a chance to oxidize. At the rate I was going, I'd be back to my own time in another few hours or so, with $15,000 or better in deposits, compound interest, and cash. If I'd been around 70, you see, she could have sent me back to the beginning of the century with the same amount of money, which would have accumulated to something like $30,000. Get it now? I did, and I felt sick and frightened. The old people had died of starvation somehow, with all that dough in cash or banks. I didn't give a hang if the time travel was responsible or something else was. I wasn't going to be found dead in my hotel and have Lou Pape curse my corpse because I'd been borrowing from him when, since 1931, I'd had a little fortune put away. He'd call me a premature senile psychotic, and he'd be right from his point of view, not knowing the truth. Rather than make the deposit in October 1938, I grabbed a battered old cab and told the driver to step on it. When I showed him the ten-dollar bill that was in it for him, he squashed down the gas pedal. In 1938, ten dollars was real money. We got a mile away from the bank, and the driver looked at me in the rearview mirror. "'How far you want to go, mister?' My teeth were together so hard that I had to unclench them before I could answer. "'As far away as we can get. Cops after you?' No, but somebody is. Don't be surprised at anything that happens, no matter what it is. You mean like getting shot at? He asked worriedly, slowing down. You're not in any danger, friend. I am. Relax and step on it again. I wondered if she could still reach me this far from the bank and handed the guy the bill. No justice sticking him for the ride in case she should. He pushed the pedal down even harder than he had been doing before. We must have been close to three miles away when I blinked and was standing outside the first bank I'd seen in 1931. I don't know what the cab driver thought when I vanished out of his hack. He probably figured I'd opened the door and jumped while he wasn't looking. Maybe he even went back and searched for a body splashed all over the street. Well, it would have been a hopeless hunt. I was a week ahead. I gave up and drearily made my deposit. The one from early October that I'd missed, I put in with this one. There was no way to escape the babe with the beautiful hard face, gorgeous warm body, and plans for me that all seemed to add up to death. I didn't try any more. I went on making deposits, mailing orders to her stockbrokers, and putting down bets that couldn't miss because they were all past history. I don't even remember what the last one was, a fight or a race. I hung around the bar that had long ago replaced the speakeasy until the inevitable payoff, got myself a hamburger, and headed out the door. All the envelopes I was supposed to use were gone, and I felt shaky knowing that the next place I'd see was the room with the wire mesh cage and the hooded motors. It was. She was on the other side of the cage, and I had five bank books and envelopes filled with cash amounting to more than fifteen thousand dollars, but all I could think of was that I was hungry and something had happened to the hamburger while I was traveling through time. I must have fallen and dropped it because my hand was covered with dust or dirt. I brushed it off and quickly felt my face and pulled up my sleeves to look at my arms. "'Very smart,' I said, "'but I'm nowhere near emaciation.' "'What made you think you would be?' she asked. "'Because the others always were.' She cut the motors to idling speed, and the vibrating mesh slowed down. I glared at her through it. God, she was lovely. As lovely as an ice sculpture. The kind of face you'd love to kiss and slap. Kiss and slap. You came here with a preconceived notion, Mr. Weldon. I'm a businesswoman, not a monster. I like to think there's even a good deal of the altruist in me. I could hire only young people, but the old ones have more trouble finding work and you've seen for yourself how I provide nest eggs for them they'd otherwise never have. And take care of yourself at the same time. That's the businesswoman in me. I need money to operate. So do the old people. Only they die and you don't. She opened the gate and invited me out. I make mistakes occasionally. I sometimes pick men and women who prove to be too old to stand the strain. I try not to let it happen, but they need money and work so badly that they don't always tell the truth about their age and state of health. You could take those who have social security cards and references, but those who don't are in worse need. She paused. You probably think I want only the money you and they bring back, that it's merely some kind of profit-making scheme. It isn't. You mean the idea is not just to build up a fortune for you with a cut for whoever helps you do it? I said I need money to operate, Mr. Weldon, and this method serves. But there are other purposes much more important. What you have gone through is basic training, you might say. You know now that it's possible to travel through time and what it's like. 
The initial shock, in other words, is gone, and you're better equipped to do something for me in another era. Something else? I stared at her puzzledly. What else could you want? Let's have dinner first. You must be hungry. I was, and that reminded me. I bought a hamburger just before you brought me back. I don't know what happened to it. My hand was dirty, and the hamburger was gone, as if I'd fallen somehow and dropped it and got dirt on my hand. She looked worriedly at the hand, probably afraid I'd cut it and disqualified myself. I could understand that. You never know what kind of diseases can be picked up in different times, because I remember reading somewhere that germs keep changing according to conditions. Right now, for instance, strains of bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics. I knew her concern wasn't really for me, but it was pleasant all the same. That could be the explanation, I suppose, she said. The truth is that I've never taken a time voyage. Somebody has to operate the controls in the present, so I can't say if it's possible or impossible to fall. It must be, since you did. Perhaps the wrench back from the past was too violent, and you slipped just before you returned. She led me down to an ornate dining room, where the table had been set for two. The food was waiting on the table, steaming and smelling tasty. Nobody was around to serve us. She pointed out a chair to me, and we sat down and began eating. I was a little nervous at first, afraid there might be something in the food, but it tasted fine, and nothing happened after I swallowed a little and waited for some effect. "'You did try to escape the time tractor beam, didn't you, Mr. Weldon?' she asked. I didn't have to answer. She knew. "'That's a mistaken notion of how it functions. The control beam doesn't cover area. It covers era. You could have flown to any part of the world, and the beam would still have brought you back. Do I make myself clear?' She did. "'Too bloody clear.' I waited for the rest. "'I assume you've already formed an opinion of me,' she went on. "'A rather unflattering one, I imagine. "'Pitch is the cleanest word I can find. "'But a clever one. "'Anybody who could invent a time machine would have to be a genius. "'I didn't invent it. "'My father did, Dr. Anthony Roberts, "'using the funds you and others helped me provide him with.' "'Her face grew soft and tender. "'My father was a wonderful man, a great man.' But he was called a crackpot. He was kept from teaching or working anywhere. It was just as well, I suppose, though he was too hurt to think so. He had more leisure to develop the time machine. He could have used it to extort repayment from mankind for his humiliation. But he didn't. He used it to help mankind. Like how? I goaded. It doesn't matter, Mr. Weldon. You're determined to hate me and consider me a liar. Nothing I tell you can change that. She was right about the first part. I hadn't dared let myself do anything except hate and fear her. But she was wrong about the second. I remember thinking how Lou Pape would have felt if I had died of starvation with over fifteen thousand dollars after borrowing from him all the time between jobs. Not knowing how I'd got it, he'd have been sore, thinking I'd played him for a patsy. What I'm trying to say is that Lou wouldn't have had enough information to judge me. I didn't have enough information yet, either, to judge her. "'What do you want me to do?' I asked warily. "'Everybody but one person was sent into the past on specific errands, "'to save art treasures and relics that would otherwise have been lost to humanity. "'Not because the things might be worth a lot of dough,' I said nastily. "'You've already seen that I can get all the money I want. "'There were upheavals in the past, great fires, wars, revolutions, vandalism, "'and I had my associates save things that would have been destroyed.' Oh, beautiful things, Mr. Weldon. The world would have been so much poorer without them. El Greco, for instance, I asked, remembering the raving old man who had been found wandering with seventeen thousand dollars in his coat lining. El Greco, too. Several paintings that had been lost for centuries. She became more brisk and efficient-seeming. Except for the one man I mentioned, I concentrated on the past. The future is too completely unknown to us, and there's an additional reason why I tentatively explored it only once— but the one person who went there discovered something that would be of immense value to the world. What happened to him? She looked regretful. He was too old. He survived just long enough to tell me that the future has something we need. It's a metal box, small enough to carry, that could supply this whole city with power to run its industries and light its homes and streets. Sounds good. Who'd you say benefits if I get it? We share the profits equally, of course. But it must be understood that we sell the power so cheaply that everybody can afford it. I'm not arguing. What's the other reason you didn't bother with the future? You can't bring anything from the future to the present that doesn't exist right now. I won't go into the theory, but it should be obvious that nothing can exist before it exists. 
You can't bring the box I want, only the technical data to build one. Technical data? I'm an actor, not a scientist. You'll have pens and weatherproof notebooks to copy it down in. I couldn't make up my mind about her. I've already said she was beautiful, which always prejudices a man in a woman's favor, but I couldn't forget the starvation cases. They hadn't shared anything but malnutrition, useless money, and death. Then again, maybe her explanation was a good one, that she wanted to help those who needed help most, and some of them lied about their age and physical condition because they wanted the job so badly. All I knew about were those who had died. How did I know there weren't others? A lot more of them than the fatal cases, perhaps, who came through all right and were able to enjoy their little fortunes. And there was her story about saving the treasures of the past and wanting to provide power at really low cost. She was right about one thing. She didn't need any of that to make money with. Her method was plenty good enough using the actual records of the past to invest in stocks, bet on sports, all sure gambles. But those starvation cases... Do I get any guarantees? I demanded. She looked annoyed. I'll need you for the data. You'll need me to turn it into manufacture. Is that enough of a guarantee? No. Do I come out of this alive? Mr. Weldon, please use some logic. I'm the one who's taking the risk. I've already given you more money than you've ever had at one time in your life. Part of my motive was to pay for services about to be rendered. Mostly it was to give you experience in traveling through time. And to prove to me that I can't run out, I added. That happens to be a necessary attribute of the machine. I couldn't very well move you about through time unless it worked that way. If you'd look at my point of view, you'd see that I lose my investment if you don't bring back the data. I can't withdraw your money, you realize. I don't know what to think, I said, dissatisfied with myself, because I couldn't find out what, if anything, was wrong with the deal. I'll get you the data for the power box, if it's at all possible, and then we'll see what happens. Finishing eating, we went upstairs, and I got into the cage. She closed the circuit, the motor screamed, the mesh blurred, and I was in a world I never knew. End of The Old Die Rich by H. L. Gold, Part 1